Good morning. It's good to see you all uh, this, this morning. Actually, I, it's not too light. I, we know that a lot of folks, you know, it's June, school's out, time to go. And so we're missing a lot of our brothers and sisters, but uh, I'm thankful for those of you that are here and those of you that are either online or will watch uh, later. Uh, welcome. We are going uh, slowly but surely through 1 Corinthians, which I've entitled A Letter to a, a Juvenile Church. Church that thinks itself to be mature, but Paul, in essence, is saying, uh, my word is not his, you're really just a Bay Area church, and um, you're, not, you're not mature. And he, uh, he, the initial, this first part of the letter, he gets some feedback from somebody in the household there, and uh, they kind of tell him what's going on, and he begins to address the different issues. And, and last week in particular, um, he addressed um, this thing that was going on in the church, doesn't give us much details, but what we do know is this, as one Christian seemed to be dishonest or dishonorable somehow in a business deal with another Christian and kind of cheated them, and then the other Christian's response was to take them to the courts um, publicly. And, uh, and obviously this was a clear case between one person in a church versus another person in the church. Uh, there's even reason to believe the way the system works that this is probably done in, in the open air market uh, uh, in that day and time. And so it's a very public kind of thing. And so on one hand, uh, Paul kind of concludes that by telling the person who did the cheating, um, that is not what believers do. But then he also tells the person who took them to court, um, not that they should have taken them to court, but that they should have had the, kept it within the church because of the example to the rest of things, that it would have been better, right, if they, if they suffered loss. It, it would have been better uh, if they had just let it go, gave up their rights, or, in, or let me just be plain, or were a doormat. I know you hate that. But Paul argues it would have been a you better doormat than the example that you set for the world. The, the, the fact that you basically said we're no different than everybody else kind of a thing. And then, um, and then he's going to turn his attention now specifically to the fact that the reason this happened was because there's somebody in their business dealings that was still acting the way they act before they came to Christ. And, and he's not only going to talk to this one, but he's going to talk about to some other issues where they're in... They're now following Jesus. They now go to church. We're going to find out later there's some pretty amazing things happening. There's some miracles and, and some word from God's coming down. And there's some really amazing things happening on one hand. But on the other hand, their lives have not fundamentally changed from when they came to Christ. And so we're going to, we're going to pick this up in uh, chapter 6. And he's basically going to say, here's, the, here's my overall take. Healthy body healthy life. Now, um, I'm not talking about the modern day version of this. The modern day version of this is if you eat and, you know, depending on which web page you're on, depends on what you eat. It could be all meat. It could be no meat. It could be vegetables. It could be fish in this. It could be whatever. Pick one, right? And, and in essence, what we've done is we've made an idol out of the body, okay? Now, there is a connection, and I'm going to talk about that, but this is not what I'm talking about. What he's going to argue is that, is that your, your physical body and your spiritual life are connected. And when, when you, what you do with the body will affect what you do, how, the condition of your soul. All right? So, again, here's the first principle. Coming right out of the, the judicial turmoil is he says this, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. It, it, in essence, it's a, it's a warning. It's a shot across the bow. Now, remember, this comes right out of the context of what he just said about judicial, uh, about taking a, um, cheating a brother or sister and then going before the courts. All right? So picking up in verse 9, he says this. Or do you not know? See, that? or do you not know means it's a continuing thought. Right? So he just says that uh, you yourselves cheat and do wrong. You do this for your brothers and sisters. So then he picks up. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? That's that wrongdoers is the 
translation of unrighteous. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. All right, so just after uh, addressing one Christian who cheated another Christian, the main thought that he comes across right after this is that there are certain kind of folks that will not inherit the kingdom of God. And what you'll see here in the next slide is he actually kind of brackets um, a list that, he's, that he gives uh, that these wrongdoers or the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he's, when he's done with the list, he says those folks will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? And that, now what comes in between is a, is a list. All right? And I'm just going to quickly go through the list because, quite frankly, the list is not what's the, the most important thing. Like, what did he include in the list? It's just an example. Okay? Now, it is an example that connects to what comes before, and it's an example about what's coming after. But he could have picked other words and other ideas. But these are the ones that he picks, right? First, he says, um, all right, here we go. Um, the sexually immoral. So that's just a general, the widest net you can for a, a, having sex outside of the way God designed it. Let me just be clear. God designed sex. You enjoy it because he wanted you to enjoy it. But, but he also, what we find from the very beginning is he created it to be this intimate, unifying connection between two committed male and female adults. And within that relationship, it is to be enjoyed because it's part, it's part of the connection. It's part of the, the, the till death do us part commitment that they make that make it so awesome. Anything, anything outside of that misses the mark. So it's just, it's just, a, gen, just a general term in that regard, right? And then he says, nor idolaters, and that's just worshiping other idols other than God, nor adulterers, in other words, that's uh, um, having a physical relationship with somebody, though Jesus would add even thinking about it, uh, outside of the marriage covenant. Uh, now, in the NIV it says here, nor men who have sex with men. The, the problem is there's actually two words here. And they kind of mean the same thing, which is why they interpret it this way, but they mean different things. One is kind of being effeminate. Okay? The other is being uh, a more uh, the dominant. Okay? So, for instance, if you look at relationships uh, between same-sex folks, one person usually plays the passive, which we traditionally give to the woman, and one person usually plays the more dominant. He actually uses two words to reflect that idea, but they're both have to do with same sex. Okay? So even though they kind of bring it down into to one idea, Paul brings it down into, he breaks it down to from whichever direction you come, this is sin. Now, in this day and time, from a Jewish background, this is not, there's nothing to discuss. You just move on. It's like a, a, adultery. No one's going to argue it. I understand today we want to argue it. But what you need to understand is it's a modern phenomena where we try to go back and redo Scripture or just ignore Scripture. Scripture has been clear. Paul's, if Paul was writing to a Judaism, Jewish audience, he doesn't, he doesn't have to say it's wrong. He, he only points to it to say, you know, that's what those Gentiles do because they all know it's wrong. Go to Romans chapter 1 if you're curious. Okay? But he says this, this is wrong. But then he goes on, right? I'm not just picking on that because he says thieves. Right? A lot of times we want to make that one, the same-sex thing, like it's some separate, special. It's in the same list as thieves. Which, by the way, I think he adds because he just talked about one in this business dealing, stealing from somebody else, right? Nor the greedy. Guilty. Nor the greedy, nor drunkenness. Drunkenness isn't just drinking, right? It's when you lose, con it's when you lose control. 
You can no longer control what you're, uh, what you're doing or that you need it in order to feel normal. Uh, nor slanderers. That's basically people who go online and say the things they say about other people to tear them down. It didn't end that day because they didn't have online, so it was in these little social circles, but it's the same thing. Nor swindlers. Swindlers is the same thing as thieves, except that it, uh, they're um, a little bit overt, sometimes violently so. These folks will not inherit the kingdom of God. These folks will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I think it's really important because I'm, some of you right now are going, I'm guilty of one or more of that list. I'm guilty of that. And you're saying that I will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, first of all, your argument's not with me. It's with Paul by the power of the Holy Spirit or the direct communication that he had with Jesus. I'm just the messenger. But on the other hand, he goes, he goes on to say here that that's what some of you were. Right, we'll have this next slide which kind of highlights that. He says, that's what some of you were. In other words, he, in other words he's saying, in, in your past, this was the major identifier in your life. Now, he's not saying you may not, we not, may not wrestle with some of those things. Maybe you have some of those inclinations, right? Maybe you're, you're, you still, you know, uh, were tempted to, and maybe you even did maybe cheat on your taxes, which you should repent of and make right. Okay? The greedy. Maybe, maybe you weren't completely honest in a business deal. Maybe you still have feelings for people of the same, whatever it, whatever it may be. There, it, when you decided to follow Jesus, that identity, that this is what I did without consequence, that, that this, is, this is just you know, me being me, it's okay to do, that's past. Because the people that embrace that as it being okay, the people that embrace that as their identity, they will not they will not inherit the kingdom of God. He says, but you were this, but there's been something different. So notice what he doesn't say, but now you got it all together. Woo! But you've been worked really hard, but now, you know, you're at church, and we all know everybody at church has their life together. <laughs> yeah, right. We're, you're laughing because it's, it's not true, right? It's absolutely not true. Right, but then he points out what, what has been what is different. Why are we different? And it all has to do with what, what God did through Jesus. First of all, he he washed us. We, we see this uh, uh, idea in, in Hebrews that we were um, our hearts were sprinkled to be cleanse us from guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure uh, water. It's just the idea that the Corinthians, when they received Jesus, um, there was a cleansing process. So they were washed their sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. When they, confess their, when they confess their sins. Kind of a deal. The same thing, the same idea is sanctified. Though, remember, sanctified is this uh, term that they borrowed from the temple, right? Early, early on in the Hebrew scriptures, God gives us an example of what is to come in the temple. The temple is where God was. You went there to worship him. But in order to worship him, you had to, A, here's the thing you did. Right now, if you go to Israel, right, on the way up to the temple, there are, there are several baptistries, Places where you can bathe because you are to clean, you are to wash before you could even enter the outer courts of the temple. And then when you get to the temple, what do you do? You take an animal and you kill it. Because, because the way the temple was made, made in order to, to be used for holy things, which means sanctified, they had to kill an animal and spread blood on it. And so, so you were made for holy purposes because you received Jesus' blood basically on your life. Now you're different. And therefore, the result is, is that you're justified. In other words, now you stand before God. Before, God, God said um, no to you and I entering the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because we were that list. We were far from him and wanted nothing to do from him. And there was nothing that we could do to make up that gap. But then Jesus stood in the gap for us. And, and he washed us, and he sanctified us, and now we stand justified from God. Again, not because of what we did, but because of what he did, which is connects it here. We were justified specifically in the name of the Lord, meaning master. Uh, Jesus, Yeshua, is the Hebrew word, which means God saves. Christ means Messiah, the promised hero. And, by the way, by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. 
who comes from the Father, comes from God. Here you got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These things happen. So what in essence he was saying is there was a change in your life, but there should be, your life should be marked by a change. Even though it's not completely gone, it should be evident to people that your life is on a different course. Is on a different course. So for instance, if you tell me uh, that you had this, this realization through the doctor or whatever else, that you want to live healthy, you should not tell me that over a Big Mac and an extra large fries and a huge, right? I'm, I, I know my doctor said that I got to, right? Because what we, I'm like, and you think this is, this is your new life now? But what you're doing and what you say your new life is different. That's what he's saying. He, might, he's, he, he understands that there are evenings where, you know, we're overwhelmed and we just kind of throw it out the door and we sneak into McDonald's for Big Mac. But that's different. That's different than saying, I, I, I think this is a good thing, but I'm going to eat a Big Mac whenever I want to. That was your old identity. This is your new identity. Now, from there, he understands that when he goes through this list, some people are going to have some arguments because they're, engaged, they're, act, they're Corinthians that are actively engaged in this, that are justifying what they're doing. And so he addresses that because he addresses those excuses, in other words, that they're going to have for bodily, using their body for unrighteousness. All right? These are verses 12 through 14. Here we go. Verse 12. He says, I have the right to do anything. Notice he says, you say. He's not saying this. They're saying this. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, in other words, you say, food for the stomach and stomachs for the food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. So the, the Corinthians uh, uh, have this saying, uh, I have the right to do anything. Now, there's a good chance that this saying arose from actually Christian teaching. Okay? Christians in particular, we are notorious for this. Right? We take, we take one line out of the thing and we develop this whole theology off of this one line in order to justify what we want. Right? For instance, the judge not lest ye be judged. That's a famous one. It's in the Bible. Right? So anyone somebody tells us something that we don't want to hear, we say, oh, the Bible says judge not lest you be judged. Right? We completely take it out of context. That's exactly what they do. So they have the saying, you know, we don't live by the law. Paul, you said we don't live by the law any, anymore, so I have the right to do anything. I'm a Gentile. I'm not a Jew. And I'm free in Christ. Woohoo! Which is not really what he meant. But this is the saying. And so the, the first time he says this, apparently, right, they're using this as a license to do away with uh, anything that they please. But he, he gives them a couple principles. He says, even though you may be free from the law, not everything, right, is beneficial. Not everything is beneficial. And so even though Christ might have died for it, and you, and you may want to argue, it, hey, well, it's okay because there's no law against it, whatever it may be. Paul would say, well, but we're supposed to live as Christ. Christ sent a mission, and his mission was to lay his life down for others. His, his mission was, was to bring benefit to God's kingdom and to bring benefit to others. That's the master law of love. And so that law trumps everything. So the question you have to ask yourself is, is this beneficial? I may, I may have the right to take someone to court. I may have the the uh, right to, to do certain things or, or, you know, in my home have things a certain way or whatever it may be. But the question I have to ask myself is, is it beneficial? I might have certain rights as a boss, but the question is when I'm interacting with, with those that work for me, is it beneficial? I might have certain rights as an employee, but when I'm acting with my boss, the question is, is it beneficial? And the second time he says, I have the right to do anything, he says, there's another thing, but I will not be mastered by anything. So there's nothing, there's nothing in the Bible uh, uh, directly about 
uh, weed and drugs. They, there was drugs, don't get me wrong, but uh, it wasn't anything like we have today. It definitely wasn't synthesized the way we have today. But it'd be easy to say, well, it's the Bible doesn't just kind of silent on it. It's kind of da 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 da, right? But Paul again says, okay, but wait, wait, wait. There's a there's a principle here. I will be. I only have one master, and that's Jesus. To place anything, anything, coffee, marijuana, food, um, relationships, my children, my church maybe, to base anything in that place other than Jesus is wrong. To let anything master your life where you can't do what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, with the attitude you're supposed to do it with, and allow it to master your life, well, obviously, it's not being beneficial, and you've allowed something else to take the Lord's place. See, he broadens. He broadens it. And then he goes to another uh, saying of theirs uh, here. The, the food is for the stomach, and stomach is for the food, and God will destroy them both. The, the, the basic thing is this. Listen, God created us with the stomach. It's created with the food and the digestive system, and eventually we won't even have a body Right? Granted, we're going to have new bodies. So it really doesn't matter. Notice the Christian justification here. It doesn't really matter what you do with your body. God's going to get rid of it. And if you have an urge, and this is the argument today, why would God create them like that? Right? And I always counter, okay, I got urges, especially when I was a young man, to sleep with other people other than my wife. Would that make it right? And of course, it's no, no, no. But in this other case, if God created them that way, then it would be right. It's ridiculous. But that's exactly the argument they're making. God's going to do away with it. So, it, so it's okay. The, they, they basically break the body from the soul. And they say, we can do anything in the body because you know, the soul is going to live on and there's going to be a new body. And it doesn't... The Christian justification. This is believers that are doing this. And, he, and then he, and he goes on to say, right, but the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality. It's, that was not God's intent, but it's meant for the Lord. And the Lord is intended for the body. Your body, even your fallen body that, that does want to destroy itself. It does absolutely have those urges. It was meant, though, it was designed to serve the Lord. And to use it for any other purpose would be unrighteous, would be, would be wrong. And he goes on to say, by God's power, oh, no, no, go back, go back, go back. By God's power, he, was ra he raised the Lord from the dead, and we also were raised. So this is what we know. When the Lord was raised from the dead, he didn't just, he wasn't just spirit. He was body. And one of the hopes that we have is that even though we'll be separated someday from this flesh that does want to destroy ourselves, we will be given a new body. But what his point is, is this. If God went out of his way to give Jesus a new body, he's going to give you a new body. It's because the soul, he created our soul to be in conjunction with the body. It was designed. Yes, you'll get a new one, but that doesn't mean that it's original design. Before sin wasn't his intention, wasn't that we serve God with our bodies. Are you following? All right. And there, here he, sh he shifts because they have a particular problem. Corinth is, again, a lot like the Bay Area. Anything goes, kind of a society. Uh, the teaching about uh, uh, what's about to come, sexual morality, prostitutes, prostitution was especially important for the Corinthian church um, because the temple of the love goddess Aphrodite was in Corinth. It's bad everywhere, but Corinth is like San Francisco of the area. All right. The temple employed more than a thousand prostitutes and actually sleeping with a prostitute was part of worship. Everything was religious back here. There's no atheists. Everything was religious. Right? But they just created some, some religions where you could basically do anything. Right? And, and that was the argument. The argument was our faith makes you feel better. And the best thing that makes you feel good is sex. And so in order to worship, come have sex. Paul clearly states that Christian, though, should have no part of this sex immorality, even though it is part of culture. He's, Paul is going to smack culture right in the face face. And I can guarantee you there's people in this day and time just like there's people in our day and time going, well, Paul's unloving. 
Paul doesn't understand grace. The only reason we know about grace is because, well, Jesus, who taught Paul, who wrote it down. And so Paul goes on, and starting in verse 15, says this. He says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never! Do you not know that he who unifies himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said that two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual morality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are not your own. So what he's going to do, there's, there's three do you not knows in this one. All right. So the first one comes right uh, uh, right first. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ yourself? Now, he's talking about the physical body. He's talking about the physical body. He's saying that, that, that here's the truth I want you to know, that your body, when you, when you join, when you decided to follow Jesus, your body was dedicated to Christ. And then, and, then he, and then he basically says, shall, shall then I take the members of Christ and unite them with a the prostitute. So this is the picture he wants you to have in your head, okay? He wants you to say, your body equals Christ. Therefore, if you were to sleep with a prostitute, Christ is sleeping with a prostitute. And I hope that makes your stomach turn. If it doesn't, you have another issue. But that picture should make your stomach turn. But that's, that's his argument. If you wouldn't put Christ with a prostitute, why would you put your body? Because your body is a member of Christ. He's trying to stir some strong emotions here. Right? The second, do you not know? Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? You might say, well, I'm not really. I mean, it's just a physical thing. But he says, whoa, 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 whoa. Here's the truth that we know. Right? That when you have... Uh, uh, sex with someone, if you have sex, in this case, specifically with a prostitute, you're becoming one with her. Guess what? Paul and Jesus believe in the, in the Hebrew scriptures. Because then he quotes Genesis 2. For it is said, the two will become one flesh. Remember? Man shall leave, leave his, his, his family, he will cleave to her, and the two shall become one flesh. Paul believes that's literal. That there's something spiritual, there's something dynamic that's happening there. And so in essence, you're, you, when you sleep with someone else, you are becoming one flesh with them. In this case, a prostitute, you're becoming one flesh with them. But he says, here's the reality of you're following Jesus, but whoever's united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. You are one with the Lord. So going back, so if you're one with the Lord and you become one with the prostitute, you've made the Lord and the prostitute lay together. And that should just, should just. And if I, if I wanted to push this, I would just, I would just say, if, and Jesus said, if you even think about adultery, you're committing adultery. So I would say, if you're unified with Christ and you're filling your head with uh, images of pornography, and that's the same thing, then you're unifying Christ's image with pornography. And that should turn your stomach. And so, so, so he, he just in case it's clear, he says, flee from sexual immorality. Head the other direction. Remember Joseph, when Potiphar's wife made an advance, he didn't just say, no, ma'am, no, man. He took off so fast that when she grabbed his jacket, he left it behind. That's what got him in trouble when she lied about it. But that was the appropriate response. This isn't something you mess with. This isn't something you started to stay strong with. Flee sexual immorality. And then he says this, this interesting thing. All the sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Well, this is actually easier than you think. What, what he's saying is this. He just said that when you have sex with someone else, you become one. No other sin, right? If, if, I, were, if I were to steal something along with Lynn, that doesn't make us one. Right? If we, were, if, we, if we both together were to criticize a politician, we probably shouldn't, but we do. That doesn't make us one. 
But our, our physical union absolutely does make us one. And therefore, that sin is different than the others because it, it, it involves this coming together and this entanglement of oneness. And so when we do that outside the way God designed it, we, we, are, we, are, we are fundamentally harming ourselves. And any of you, and I know there's many of you here, any of you who have been um, uh, molested, raped, taken advantage of there, you know that wound is deeper and different than a lot of the others. Probably all the others. Because of the, the, what was stolen, what was taken, the oneness that was there. The oneness that was there. And that pain that you feel, by the way, God is saying, I get it, I know. It is. And you keep saying, why can't I get over it? Well, it's because of this. And then he gives us a third, do you not know? Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? So again, he goes back to that, that Old Testament principle where the temple, there was the Holy of Holies that was sprinkled with blood and then God descended in the temple and that's where he was, God amongst his people. And the great thing is because of the blood of Jesus Christ now, the Holy Spirit, God, comes and resides now, again, he's hoping that you and I would think, you know, I would never, I might, I might sin, but I would never go into the Holy of Holies and sin. But in essence, he says, when you use your body like that, that's exactly what you're doing. Because your body is now the Holy of Holies. Your body is now the Holy Spirit is residing there. And so he reminds you, guess what? Your body is not your own. Why? Because the temple now, this tent, it was just a tent. But as soon as they sanctified it, washed it, sanctified it, it was justified, God came into it, it was now his. The same with your body. Your body now belongs to the Lord. And then he gives us this summary principle in verse 20. And it's, it's really, really simple that you were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your body. That's the principle. And actually, the next slide is the verse, which basically says the same thing. You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. In essence, he's concluding that, that you and I, the price was the blood of Jesus Christ. He was our lamb. And so now, just like the holy of holies is used for holy things, our bodies should be used for holy, for holy things. And what I, would, what I would say, I think a lot of times as as uh, secular Christians living in a secular society, we forget that we weren't just saved from something. We weren't just saved from hell. We weren't just saved from God's wrath. You were saved for something. You were saved for the ability to live like Jesus. You were saved so that you could be righteous. Yes, the Bible comes along and says you're not righteous. But then it says, Jesus paid the penalty for you not being righteous. And then you're given the Holy Spirit. Why? So you can be righteous. Now, granted, it, is, it, it will not be completed until we, until we get into glory. But he wants us to pursue it. He wants us to pursue it. If I told you to jump up on a roof, you wouldn't, and you, two stories, hi, you would not be accountable to get, for not being on the roof when I came back because you can't. But if I said you need to get up on the roof and I provided a ladder or a lift, I would come back and expect you to be on top of that roof. And if you told me, well, I can't, I would say, well, yes, but I provided a ladder. I provided a lift. That's exactly what God's going to do. You cannot live righteous. God would say, yes, but I forgave your unrighteousness. And then I gave you the Holy Spirit to give you a power to do the things you cannot do. Therefore, you should be on top of that roof or at least should be halfway up the ladder. Because sitting on the ground, I wonder if you know me at all. Sitting on the ground, I wonder if you know me at all. Now, I know how the enemy works, because this way it works in my life. Some of you, like I say, we are guilty. There's no one here. If we took this list and really got down, there's nobody here that's not guilty. And not just guilty like when you were young. And maybe not just guilty when you were, before you became a Christian. But even now. And so that's what the enemy's doing. The enemy's saying, well, <laughs> you know what he's saying. 
He's saying that you're destined to hell. There's no way you can do it. You and I both know. You've been trying. You can't do it. You might as well give up. Forget this God thing. That's fire and hell and brimstone kind of stuff. You don't need this. Or he's saying, man, you're this small. You're this small. You're this small. That is not what the scripture is saying. That is not, that is not, that is not what it's saying. Now, if you've justified that in your mind and you're just kind of going on and say, well, that's who I am. And well, then I think you should listen to the Holy Spirit. I do think there's some conviction. But if you've repented like I have and continue to do, you are no longer that thing. You may have been, you may have slept around a lot. You may have cheated people. You may have abused your children. You may have have been a self-centered person who only thought of themselves. But that's who you were before Jesus. You are now a new creation. And so quickly as, uh, as Corey comes up to get ready to lead us in the last song, I just want to talk really briefly about this last principle here. Go ahead and bring it up because I, I lost it in my nose. What is the connection between the physical body and our souls? What, what is the connection between the two? One of the main lessons, listen, this is not hard to argue. You know what we learned during COVID? You can't just keep the body healthy and expect to be healthy. We know that for a fact now. People need each other. We said, oh, we're keeping the body healthy. I know they're dying. I know they're sick. I know they're whatever, but don't let anybody near them. And we found out that was worse than if they had died sooner, but with people around them. We found out that people need meaning. They need to be able to go somewhere. They need to be able to work. They need to be able to, we found out there's a great connection. I'm not, I'm not, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to extreme. We're saying you, you can't ever you know, protect the body, not do something because something really, really dangerous is going on. But what we did learn is that when you do that, it's at a cost. There is a connection between your body and your emotions. There's a connection between your emotions and your soul, and between your soul and the body. There's absolutely a connection. You cannot do one thing and not affect the others. It is impossible. As a matter of fact, in psychology, they call it disassociation. It's very unhealthy to disassociate. I would also say this, that... that Anytime a follower of Jesus downplays or forgets that we are terminally sinful without Christ and that it's not that bad, there are two, there's several results, but there's two big ones. The one is that we cheapen what Jesus did. We cheapen what Jesus did. That he suffered, that he was rejected, that he suffocated, that he gave his life for us. It's not that big a deal. And Jesus just died for it. He just left the heavenly throne for it. But the second thing that we do is that we are less compassionate, what I consider true compassion, about people who have never heard the gospel. Why? Because we begin to project it's no big deal onto them. And, and, and we begin to say things like, you know what, but they're basically a good person, as if this sin in their life will not consume them. Like the Bible is not true. And all of a sudden we find ourselves compromising on they're not that bad and, you know, they're they're basically a good person. What you're basically saying is compared to all the other evil people around, including yourself, they're okay. And you're probably right. But that's not God's standard. God's standard is Jesus. God's standard is what he created us for. And in that, they are going to suffer in this life. No matter how good they are, no matter how much they love someone or, or whatever, it will damage them. Just like our sin damages us. And then we don't have this strong thing. I'm not saying a strong motivation to set them right. You cannot set them right any more than someone could set you right. But they, there should be a strong thing that they need Jesus. Because at the end of, the, end, end of their sin row is the same end of your sin row. They will not, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Period. Exclamation mark. Don't argue with me. Go back to God's word and wrestle with it. Father God, if there's anyone here, dear Lord, that doesn't like church because it's all fire and brimstone, Lord, please, I pray. 
by the power of the Holy Spirit that they also heard your words of grace and forgiveness, dear God. But for those of us who are following Jesus, dear God, I do pray for a healthy, out and out fear of God. The fear of the one who, who has control over our souls, who has control over whether or not a coin can show up in the mouth of a fish or, or the sun can stand still, or whether or not we get a job or our family thrives or whatever it may be, dear God, may we have true fear. And may we choose to do the hard thing, God, and climb the ladder to put effort into what you've provided for us to do, not just for our own benefit, but for the benefit of those that we love and those whom you love. Will you do that work in us that we cannot do ourselves? In the name of our Lord and Savior who makes that possible, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen.